morning. It's day minus one. Mark in the park. It's gonna be a long day driving, filming, whatever, but hopefully we can show you some behind the scenes on the way up. And take a look at this. This is how you start off a trip. Yeah. Let's get going. <laughs> Oh wow, that's a lot of stuff. Road trip, here we go. First stop, Ian's place. Some stuff. But no person. I don't I don't know where he went. Oh there he is. Found him. Hey. There you go. Thank you. Oh yeah. <laughs> This this has got to last for the all the um, six fifteen wake ups every day. How's it going, Steve? How are you today? Good, you? Yeah. Good. Trunk's full now. Holy cow! Oh, you got you can the leave, tent. You can leave this out of the TV. <laughs> <laughs> so we're actually packing now. Uh, we're gonna have a couple bags, one kind of for the crew. Uh, one for Mark and Ian, and uh, yeah, it's, I don't know, we're gonna have some things that cross between them because obviously we can't fit everything into one, but it's a bit of a puzzle right now. Well, even though we only showed one barrel, there's four of us, so <laughs> we're going back downstairs to pack again. Island, you gotta climb up a big hill, and then it's just covered in a forest of hemlocks. Just got to the end of the portage. Holy. <laughs> that, was only, that was the first one. It's not that it's heavy, it's humid. Sunrise. <coughs> Do I look silly with this hood up? <laughs> Don't step in the sky. Getting sweat all over the camera. Oh Lord. So it's 2.45 p.m. and we're on Big George Lake. We made it. You alright man? You good? Mark asked me to make breakfast, so I guess I should. Since it's the one day I probably can. Welcome Mark. Thank you sir. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, why aren't you paddling? <laughs> I got this. <laughs> How much work he's done all day. <laughs> oh. Can you stop that GoPro? <laughs> 407 transponder. Ow, ow, ow. Ow, that hurt. That's annoying. I can hear it truck off in the distance. Alright, get away from that. <laughs> I was gonna take a step forward and I looked down like, oh, I can't go that way. Pretty windy. Yeah, that's a lot of people with Mike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Time lapse up here. Good morning. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Technological problems here. Both guys forgot their microphones. You might as well grab the purple bag if you're going back. <laughs> How do you navigate this? Do you choose the log? Or the wet? It is for me, but you know, like I can, I can manage. Like I said, I'll just, I'll just read. Hi. Standing back with a sense of pride, hands on hips, and going, I think I'm gonna make it through those portages pretty much unscathed. <laughs> Canoe on my head, my light pack on my back. I'll be springing up the portage like a jackrabbit. And then the dynamic changed slightly. <laughs> I give you a 80 pound, 115. I'm sorry. <laughs> The new fashion in uh, TV is one crock, one shoe. Gotta make a statement, right? What the? Now it's our turn. Hopefully we don't flip. Yeah. Looks like Steve got the brunt of it. Oh, <laughs> well, it's, we'll it's taller than you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wonder why for a second I canceled that dentist appointment for today. Okay, come out. Oh. Oh. I'm caught on something. There we go. Thank God. Holy <laughs> I had a rest right there. The moment I saw you, I went, I, here we go. Holy cow. <laughs> what the hell was that? Are going now? Yep. Okay. Sour turn. You ready, Steve? Ready. Ready. Hold on to your hats. Ah! Hey. <laughs> Filming, marking the park. Steve. <laughs> in the creek. Oh. <laughs> oh. Who's driving this thing? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> so one rock. Just one. I had to hit it. <laughs> the wild Steve in the background. <laughs> Camera guy. That's the camera guy. Yeah. Steve, what'd you do? I don't know. But now it completes the trifecta. Blood, sweat, and tears. What do you want out of a portage? The first little bit. Mm-hmm. <sighs> made it, Steve. That's it, that's Holy. all for portaging. All done, man. That's it. High five, buddy. <laughs> He's too tired to get home. So I'm going to go over everything really quickly here. Uh, if I could talk about everything, this would take forever. So if you have any questions about anything I talk about or, or any of the pieces of equipment, just comment down below and I'll answer them as soon as possible. So let's start off with the power banks. We have three power banks here. We actually have a fourth one here. This is just a standard USB power bank. Nothing special, it's just for phones and it's more or less a backup. These are the main battery packs. They have multiple inputs. And these two solar panels here, uh, 100 watt solar panels, power those, those packs. Those are the adapters for and extensions and everything. I'll explain a little bit more about the uh, solar panels later and how the charging system works. We have all the camera batteries, all six of them. I can go a whole day on one of these. So one, two, three, four days in total. These packs run the backup microphone. They also run this light here, which is what we use for talking by the fire. 
it just clips right in there. I can go a whole, the entire trip without changing this battery on this light, but if we had to use the backup microphone, uh, we would be going through many. These batteries here, these are AA Pro batteries, um, high capacity rechargeable uh, nickel cadmium, I believe, uh, and they're 2,700 milliamp hours each. So they, they, take, they hold a lot of juice. They're for the wireless microphones. Um, and that's about it, I believe. But we do eat through uh, two per wireless microphone a day. So it's a, it's a effort to keep these things charged up, especially since this charger only takes two, uh, two double A's at a time so and it takes about three hours to charge a, a set of batteries so there's a lot of uh, night charging and switching batteries out often which is uh, a big struggle sometimes talking more about batteries these are the batteries for this camera that I'm using right now this is the diary camera this uh, charger is for these bad boys here um, I think it just goes on there. Uh, I can put two on there, but I prefer to put one at a time because it charges faster for one at a time. Um, this charger is for these little guys, that for this camera here, and a double A charger, and a charger for uh, the backup microphone and the LED panel lights. Everything, almost everything is done by USB which is pretty nice because then I can plug it into anything, uh, any power bank, even this one if I need it to. Uh, unfortunately, this is the power hog. It takes full 24 volts in, so uh, basically one of these will charge one of these and half of these, so one and a half. Uh, there's so much power loss through the conversion of converting it up to 24 volts. This gets really hot, even if you use a uh, you plug it into a wall. So it's there's a lot of power loss within this uh, when it's transforming power from one voltage to another. Unfortunately, and there's no way to work around that. Here's the main microphone that Mark wears. Uh, it's a digital wireless, not an analog wireless. Uh, same with this, digital wireless. This is the backup receiver and the backup microphone. We have uh, wind breakers here. They're the little fluffy things that you see uh, on their life jackets. They help with uh, obviously wind noise. Let's see if I can get this open here. There we go, look at that. So there's a hole in here somewhere and that's where the microphone goes into. And it just helps on windy days with that noise. They're called dead cats and those ones are called mini dead cats if you ever wanna look them up. We have our GoPro here, it's on a little magic arm. Uh, it is a GoPro Hero 5. Uh, I prefer five and up because it's waterproof on its own, which means uh, the sound that comes out of it is much better than the ones that have the enclosure where you, uh, where sound can't get in. Uh, we bring a backup suction cup, uh, a little 90 just in case we need to rotate the suction cup, and three batteries, one that's in the camera already, two here, and the charger. We have our infrared light that goes on this camera right here uh, that I'm using to shoot with uh, so we can shoot at night with uh, I only do this because of potential wildlife at night and because at uh, 5 30 a.m. I really am not interested in blinding the guys when they walk out of the tent with the uh, actual light so trying to be nice though. <laughs> Uh, move over here. We have our audio recording equipment. This is a stereo audio recorder. It also has two XLR inputs uh, that we can use for this microphone. This is a shotgun microphone. It only picks up directly what's in front of it, nothing around. And we have our XLR cable. We're going to use this for disconnects. Uh, we'll point the shotgun at the main 
noise, the main uh, feature, I guess, a, a bird, the waves, anything. And then the stereo mic will sit close by and capture stereo sound, and uh, I'll mix the two together. Moving on up over here, we have this little bag here. It's got everything from lens cleaners to plastic bags to cover cameras, uh, stickies for the uh, for the microphones, uh, so we can mount them onto clothing if we need to. Uh, yeah, this is just a general kit of, of small things that could go, get lost basically if if anything happens. Uh, let's move on up. This is our computer that we bring. It's a small little Chromebook. It's pretty light. It's cheap. It's It's got uh, water resistance to it and uh, Yeah, just it's it's all I need to, to copy footage over to a hard drive And then we got our lenses. I got a 50 1.4 a 35 1.4 we use that one mainly for talking by the fire Um because it has its uh, low light ability and it's got a big fat focus ring on it so it's easy for me to focus because focusing at f1.4 can be a challenge in itself uh, moving over we have our 70 to 200 this is most of our wildlife shots in the morning i can zoom into places um, it's also a 2.8 uh, aperture so it, you can get some nice bokeh shots uh, with the sun flaring into it. Well, we got our wide angle. Um, and then here, this is the adapter. So this adapts because the camera's a Sony camera, but these are Canon lenses. So this adapts to uh, from Canon to Sony. I'm also bringing along these uh, silica packs. These you can find these at uh, mech stores. They'll often put them out at che at the checkout, and you can grab them. They're free. Uh, they just they want people to reuse them, so they don't just throw them out. Um, I'm going to bring them just in case something gets wet, or uh, even like I know the GoPro last year we had a lot of moisture behind the lens, so I'm, I think I'm going to put it in this bag every single night with the battery compartment open to. To get it, uh, the moisture out of it as much as possible, so we don't have the same problem. Um, but they have many uses. Um, yeah, it's it's just a uh, they're very light too, and they're they're nice. But we'll see if they work. Uh, we have a few bags for for lenses. I'm gonna be getting a few more bags so they're protected in the in the pack. This is the only Pelican case that we're bringing, and. It's not full right now. A lot of the little stuff goes in here, but mainly what's in here is like this is a card reader, uh, headphones, backup headphones, uh, hard drives, and like this is uh, SD cards here. So we got a bunch of SD cards. Um, it's just basically this, this. Um, Pelican case does not get clipped onto anything. It sits in the in the canoe by itself. If we do flip, it will float. So if everything gets lost, we'll at least have all the media apart from what was ever in the anything else that get lost, which shouldn't have been like it should be uh, all new media for that morning. Uh, this will float, and we can grab this, and at least we have something as opposed to it sinking down with everything else and we have completely nothing. So that's why we, we bring it. I even uh, I slide my phone in behind here too to keep it from uh, getting wet. And uh, it's like the uber, uber backup of, of filming everything would be my phone. Whip it out and uh, we can explain the situation, finish the trip with a few shots, and that would be it. Because it would be pretty disappointing if we lost the camera, so... Yeah, it's kind of a Tetris to fit everything in here. I had to stop recording because I wanted to show you this is the other camera, the one that I'm uh, using to show you all the equipment. So here's a... this is a, a Rode Video Mic Pro Plus, I believe it's called. Um, the main features is it's got a bunch of buttons on the back um, that can, you can select things. It also turns on automatically when you turn the camera on. Um, and yeah, it's a great little camera. It does night vision, which is nice. Uh, that's the main reason why I got it. Uh, it turns off automatically when you close the screen. 
it's just a, it's a nice little light camera that we can use and it records at full broadcasting specs. It also, it's, I, I just paired it up with this little tripod. It's a Joby, uh, uh, I don't even know what model or anything. But uh, yeah, nice little little camera. The main feature is right here. This is the main camera. This is a Sony FS5. It does shoot 4K. We only shoot HD on the show because of broadcast specs. Um, but it has a uh, hot shoe, which means there's little electrical contacts in here. Take this off very carefully. If you can see that in there, there's little contacts. You can see it more on here. And because of that, this wireless mic is integrated with the system, which is pretty cool. So whenever I turn on the camera, the wireless mic turns on too. If I brought another wireless mic with me, um, I would have to turn it, either turn it on every time I turned on the camera as well, or I would have to, uh, I would have to keep it on all day and risk running out of AA batteries. This camera also has its own lens. Uh, this is an 18 to 105 f4. The I only use this during the day because f4 isn't very good for evenings and mornings due to light. Um, it does have power zoom, which is very important to me because I do do a lot of live zooms when I'm uh, when Mark's talking or. Uh, just like zooming into a portage uh, from a wider shot, whereas these are manual zooms It would be a li little bit choppy <laughs> if I did that um, So it's, it's a good range. It also has autofocus for those times that I'm walking along uh, the portage with um, You know One hand and the other hands on the canoe. It's nice to know that it will get rough focus uh, while I'm walking along getting those shots uh, it has its own shotgun microphone attached to it. We use this shotgun mainly around camp because it's so quiet in Algonquin that we can just we can just use this microphone. Uh, it's great up to six, eight feet, and after that it kind of drops off a bit. But it uh, it's definitely it helps out save batteries in the microphones because we get to turn them off. Um, another thing here is a rail system. Maybe like what? It's not even touching. Well, no, that's for this big guy right here. This weighs five pounds on its own, and then you have the adapter. Uh, it makes the this part really, really weak. So there's a lot of tension on the little little metal blades. So uh, that just that post will just hold it up. Anytime we use a lens with an adapter, we just hold it up with with that little post. It also keeps the bottom of the camera, you can see how much uh, space there is, off of the uh, off the bottom of the canoe. There's so many times when I went to pick up the camera and it was dripping, like the water was up to here or something because we were just in and out, in and out so often. So it's a, it's a nice little uh, added bonus, if you will, to save the camera from getting wet. Now the camera is on what I call the Frankenpod. It is a Monfrotto tripod. Let's see if I can get in here. It is a Monfrotto tripod with a Satchelor head on it. Satchelor makes pro heads for uh, TV, and this is, I believe, one of their smallest heads. Uh, I bring this head because I know it, I like it, it's it's the smallest one that I can get my hands on and it fits on this tripod. Now if I can show you, this tripod also is able to level. So in Mark in the Park Season 1, I uh, I had to manually like extend each leg every time to get the tripod to have a level bubble. You see that bubble right there? And that took forever. Oh, a loon! And they're gone. Now with this tripod, it's going to make everything so much faster that I can use this ball head. You can see the ball feature on here because this tripod head uh, has a 75 millimeter 
gap and uh, for a ball head and the tripod is designed for actually has a ball shape in it and it goes into it that's so i'm just adding an additional ball ball to it another cool piece of gear that i have it's pretty simple it's probably my favorite uh it's a shoulder strap it's for photography actually you strap your camera onto here and then it can be hip side um but i used it i can clip it onto here and then uh, I can uh, have it around my neck, especially when I'm in the canoe, because this thing went overboard, and then <laughs> there's no getting that back. And uh, when I'm walking down uh, portages, it's, it's a good tool that I can just let go of the camera if I need to, and I don't have to uh, put the camera down on the ground and then pick it up again, which would be a lot of work with a canoe and a very heavy pack on the back. I'm gonna show you the solar setup, so let's go outside into the sun. <sighs> so I got everything laid out here. And uh, as you can see, we got some, uh, we got the two solar panels and we got the three battery packs. Those are the most important pieces to this, uh, to this equation of many different pieces. Uh, we have some adapters, we got some uh, splitters for the for the cable, the power cables, uh, the cables that go between everything. And I got a bunch of them, because <laughs> if they fail, I need another one. And a special cable where it converts it from USB to uh, the type of connector that gets used. So this type of connector, it's a 5.5 millimeter by 2.1 millimeter. That's what it's labeled as. I'm gonna set everything up, give you a little bit of walkthrough of, of after it's set up, what it looks like, and uh, yeah, and charge a charge a camera battery. <laughs> as you can see, it is completely cloud free today, so it's perfect setup. So you can see that uh, it charges the BPU batteries nice and efficiently. So I'm all done setting up the solar panels and the batteries are currently charging nicely. Uh, it's pretty good sun today. Each one's getting around 18, 19 volts, which is pretty good. When you split it th into the three batteries, uh, so the voltage can really drop like after uh, any deviation of sun. They're 100 watts each. Uh, I don't know what that means, 100 watts at 18 volts maybe? That's what they're rated for, but they put out more than 18 volts. And obviously when the light goes down, the voltage also drops. And they do put out a steady 5 volts when it is cloudy, but that's that's, a non, that's not enough power to, to charge three 50,000 milliamp hour battery packs. So once the panels are set up, uh, it's a quick unfold, like it's Velcro, flip, 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 they're open. And uh, there's this little power center. It has a, uh, a variable voltage output on it. That's uh, 5.5 millimeter by 2.1 millimeter. Uh, it has two USB 2.4 amp outputs each, which is good for charging pretty much anything USB. That's not a quick charge item and a little light that tells you if it's getting enough light to output power. So what I do is I take a cable from each panel, I plug it into each panel, and then I connect it to one of these Ys. Now I, the Y only has one uh, male connector on it, so I plug one end in and then I use one of these barrels to connect the other one in. If I join both panels together and then plug it into the two battery packs, I get a higher voltage and a higher amperage for some reason. So it's it's uh, it was a good find to, and a good purchase to get these Ys, and also enables me to charge more than one thing at a time um, because we have three battery packs and two panels, so it's a it's a good option. I'm gonna plug in the BPU charger. And once it's booted up, I'm gonna put a battery on it, and it's charging. Now if the voltage drops too low on this, 
the little car symbol will blink because people, they assume that you're charging this with your car, which you can't unless you have a 24 volt system in your car. These panels also have little loopholes. It's great because I can uh, use these beaners here and connect them to uh, lines that go across and we can hang them. Uh, you can see in here is He's uh, hanging the panels and so that you can get an optimal angle of the sun. And in the fall, actually, it's uh, when we shot Mark in the Park both times, uh, the sun is at a 45 degree angle at its tallest. So you optimally want to have that panel at a 45 degree angle so it's capturing as much sun as possible. It's a small system. It folds up small. It's heavy, though. <laughs> it's really heavy. But it's small. It's rugged. The panels, they're great. They made it through two seasons of Mark in the Park. We're not very, uh, we're not very gentle with our gear sometimes. Um, but yeah, I like it. Hopefully you learned a lot about solar charging and uh, what we brought along with us on Mark in the Park. It's a good small system. It was the smallest system that I could find and, and get my hands on. Well, uh, everybody knows me, but behind the scenes, there's two other people coming along with us on our journey. And uh, I guess we're going to meet the crazy guys right now. You might think to yourself, what makes uh, two guys want to do that sort of thing? Lug all that gear and do a show, but you're also enthusiasts of being outdoors. So, Matt, maybe introduce yourself. I'm, uh, I'm Matt. Um... I'm the producer, director, camera, kind of everything, apart from uh, the other guys who help lug stuff around. Every shot you see on screen is all from me. There's a few others from the other two that picked up the camera and helped out. But uh, yeah, from, from beginning to end, I did it all, all the editing and everything like that. And uh, brought, brought my helpful sidekick Steve here. He brought him along this time. Uh, unlike last year where I didn't really have any anybody to help me out, Steve helped out a lot and uh, helped out with building a fire, just making the tent, anything like that. Like it was the little things that made a big difference, gave me a bit more time to, to get out and shoot some stuff. Well, we've been talking about you. Why, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, obviously I'm Steve and um, my background in, in television is uh, uh, my first five years was a lot of studio shows um, in a very controlled environment and then the next 25 were in a lot of live televised sports as an, an audio technician, uh, technical assistant in general. That's where I met Matt and uh, it was pretty soon that we crossed paths more uh, talking about trips that we had done and uh, instead of bringing out technical notes we were bringing out maps of Algonquin Park and top maps and whatnot so uh, it wasn't long before um, Matt had mentioned that he was doing uh, season one of Mark in the Park and uh, locked into pretty much that first season and started to offer some um, uh, observations and, and I had a lot of questions in regards to how he shot it and what the dynamic was like with with uh, with Mark and, and the locations and, and the gear and just the, the whole logistics of, of that type of a project. Uh, but certainly being an outdoorsy person and, and a, a tripper, I guess, uh, I was definitely uh, sharing that passion that Matt had at the same time. So that's where, uh, that's where I sort of came into the picture. So uh, it was uh, great, to be, uh, great to be invited and to, to be part of such a, a unique experience. So you'd be like a, a, very much an asset, knowing both the technical side of what is happening on on the, you know with the cameras and all the equipment and that sort of thing, and being able to help. Oh, you you know, you'll notice, you know, oh, he needs that battery charged or this this sort of thing, but also on the tripping part. So you had both both angles. You were able to just help out. Yeah, I certainly was. I was definitely interested more in the the uh, the itinerary of the trip. And, uh, and where we were going and, and what kind of challenges that was going to, um, to, to create. But uh, um, Matt was always 
rifling off information regarding the technical aspects of the show, but I was definitely more interested in the in the trip logistics than I was the technical logistics. Just and a little bit of a gearhead. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, 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 I mean, I, I have been to a lot of different parts of, of, of the park, uh, a lot of solo trips uh, and, and whatnot, but I was going to a, a place... I, I was actually quite excited about working working with Matt um, and also uh, traveling with people like yourself, Ian, and Mark, and Matt. And it was great to be part of a team where you're working with people that share the same passion, but you've never tripped with them before. So it, you, you always, it's a great experience because in both a technical aspect and a tripping aspect, you're going to learn things. You're going to be able to offer things, but you're also going to learn things from the other people involved as well. So I found that very exciting. Um, I remember just before Matt and I had sort of confirmed everything, I let him know on the phone that I was quite excited about being part of such a, a unique opportunity and, uh, and was pretty much gung-ho and ready to go. We can flip over to, to some of the uh, the gear stuff, as you're saying that you're a bit of a gearhead, Matt. Yeah. Uh, I think you had probably I don't know wh whether you had more fun looking up all the gear and figuring out what how you're going to do it, or being out on in the bush. I would say probably being out in the bush, but it's pretty up there for you, I think. Yeah, it's 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 a challenge to find a way to keep a, a pro camera running for 10 days straight out where there's no no power at all. Like the only power you got is you either harvest it from the water or you harvest it from the sun or you just bring it with you. And I, I didn't think I would want to kill you even more than I already did. So <laughs> I we chose the, uh, the solar panel route and I don't know, it's a lot of testing, a lot of a lot of research and finding out what gear works. Cause once you have it out there, you have it out there. And if it breaks, it's dead weight. We had a we had a, a purple pack at the beginning. It was it was small, but it was heavy. It was I think Mark picked it up once and he's like, "Wow, what's in here? A ton of bricks or something? Like bowling balls?" And Holy, what is in here? Bowling balls? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically batteries and solar panels. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. Um, that purple pack was the one that I would go back. And, and make the, the second trip for on uh, most of the portages. Uh, but at the same time, it was also having a lot of experience doing a, a lot of solo tripping. And because you are tripping you're and carrying amounts of weight that I never, never had ever experienced in my life. <laughs> One of the, I, I, do, I do remember going back to get that, that, that purple bag. And while I was walking back to get that purple bag, listening to the birds, looking around, listening to myself breathe, and, and enjoying the, the absolute quiet that I was experiencing at that moment, which is much of, about what the park is about. Um, but it was that that second trip that had to be done up until about day five, uh, day six, I think it was, yeah, until we finally, when because the, uh, when the, the food, the got food to, had gone down a yeah. little bit and we were able to disperse that weight, but, um, uh, the very first, I remember this the very first day of the trip, and I was just, I, I think I woke up with my with my knapsack on, but uh, I was just so I, eager to go, and we got onto the onto Big Cedar, uh, or Cedar Lake, and uh, it, the white caps were, were out there, and the wind was was blowing, it was choppy, and, and, and I didn't care, but I thought, here we are, we're, we're finally going, you know? And then we got to the first portage, and I strapped, I, well, I made an attempt to strap on that pack, and right away, I was just, <laughs> I was, I was, I was overpacked. I, I, I was outpacked. I was, I had never attempted to even try to lift anything like that in my life on, on a trip like that. And, and I remember looking over at Ian and Ian, Ian had, you know, managed to get his pack on and, and he was strapped up and ready to go. And he kind of just looked at me and he didn't know whether to laugh or whether to, I couldn't even get the pack up onto a rock to get it get it onto my body, and uh, but eventually I was alone, and so I was a little uh, a little bit less embarrassed, and I and I, I finally got figured out how to get that pack on my back, uh, and got about uh, two thirds up the first portage, and uh, <laughs> and Ian had come over the hill, I guess, to sort of check to see you know how I was making out, and the moment I, I locked eyes with him, I just broke into laughter, and he said, "Are you all right?" And I said, "I don't even know what I am right now." <laughs> 
<laughs> but it was uh, that's for that first portage for me was the game on experience for me. Uh, I, I just remember thinking before the trip that if anything, this was going to be uh, an, an adventure and an experience, and nothing nothing punched me in the face more than that very first portage to say, well, here we go. So it was uh, that was a quite a um, uh, an introduction for me as far as bringing all this gear. I mean, we all go on trips like that and go, well, I'll only bring this and I'll only bring that. And, and that's true, but we're also shooting a TV show and there's a whole other, you know, element of that. That, that, that stuff is not, not light, not lightweight at all. And um, it was definitely a challenge. Yeah. And it, it's like any other trip where the first day it's, especially at the beginning of the year the first day and you get the canoe up or the pack up on your shoulders and you start going you're like man i'm not used to this it, it kind of felt like the first trip of the year where you're just like is this pack really this heavy like am i really carrying this much weight and kind of thing but after a couple of days we got into a routine into a swing of things and we uh i was able to manage to move the gear around a little bit to kind of equalize the weight between everybody uh, which helped out instead of Steve bearing it all on on himself. I tried to take most of the the dead weight stuff, um, and uh, I think I I did the canoe the whole time. I believe I don't know yeah. if you did the no, whole. No, I never I never did the canoe. <laughs> <laughs> I had enough on my plate. Yeah. <laughs> we did sort of all find our our um, our role, and uh, um, you know, like t to carry our own weight. You know, like we all kind of found oh, okay I'm gonna do this and and I'm gonna I'll make sure that this happens and all that sort of stuff and um, I guess that's Im the important to have a group dynamic who can realize that sort of thing because you never want the person along on the trip where you're all just kind of like oh, maybe he just needs to do a little bit more yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah I agree with that. Yeah. yeah yeah no everybody was certainly pulling their weight that's for sure yeah yeah. I think the experience had to do with that too. Like you, you knew where you had to go. You knew how much time we had to get there, and how much, how much space or length of, of portages we had to cover at that point in time. And it's just like, let's just do it. Like we've done it before in past trips, and we've all been to that had that trip where we just brought way too much stuff, and yep. the pack is way too heavy, and we yep. just did it. And you just you just do it, and by the end of it, you're like, okay, well that wasn't too bad. So. But, I don't know, any uphill climbs is horrible because <laughs> going flat I found was fine until you start changing ele elevation, the weight doubled or tripled on your back and you're like, eh, help me, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah. having a, a good group of guys who, who just did it, didn't complain, just picked it up, just went to the end. And I know, I know Ian, you went to the... You went back and got the purple pack a few times to give Steve a little bit of a break and kind of thing. Like, we all helped each other out. I would have helped out more, but I had to stay yeah. with Mark. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I certainly appreciated that. And it, and it was nice to go back and get that purple pack, and then halfway halfway through the second time, you'd see Ian or you'd see yourself come back, and it'd be like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Just buy you a little bit of a break. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. And when I strapped that pack on the very, very first day, I thought to myself, I'm okay as long as I don't fall, as long as I don't trip, as, as long as I don't fall, fall or falter while trying to get the pack on, while trying to get the pack off, or, or while I had it on me, don't stumble. And I thought, as long as I, I just keep walking, small steps, that I would, that I would, I would make it. But uh, it was definitely a wake up call. There, there was one moment, though, I remember hearing about it after the fact. But um, that it was, it was probably one of the hardest portages that we did. And you decided to take a break on a log. Yes. Uh, so you know, as 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 some of the viewers would have would have seen in in a few of the. Uh, uh, episodes of, of you know getting to the end of the portage and I remember you specifically Ian saying you know I knew I wanted to I needed a rest but I wasn't gonna take that pack off I really want to stop but I think if I put this pack down I'm never gonna get it back on and that was certainly true with the 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 1810 meter unmaintained portage from Monona into Wee George uh, 
was just, it wasn't the longest portage, but it was by far the gnarliest portage. I got to a spot where I felt like maybe it was the halfway point, and I, I was just looking for that spot where I could maybe just ease the load onto something else for a moment and just give my body a bit of a break. And as I came up over the crest of this hill, <laughs> I, I, I saw this sawed off stump that was about maybe 18 inches or more off the ground. And I thought, oh my, I, I, I can't believe what I'm seeing. It's almost a mirage. This is gonna be perfect. I'm just gonna be able to just like let myself, let myself go and just take a bit of a break because the, the thing with the pack being that heavy is, is that once you, <laughs> once you let the pack take over, there's no going back. There's, there's a point of no return there. So I thought, well, this is just great, right? I can, I can get down there and, and, and let the pack rest on this, on this stump, you know? So I, I get over to the stump and I, I, I squat down, I squat down. And of course the pack just starts to take over with the weight. And I thought, okay, that's good. And as I lean back, I realize the stump is completely rotted. And as I lie back, <laughs> I just feel my, feet go straight up in the air and the, the pack starts sliding down the hill with me strapped to it like and, and I just remember thinking oh my god this isn't gonna go well and the pack slid down the hill came to a stop and the first thing I thought was well that that could have been way worse that could have been way I thought I was gonna get I thought I was gonna roll but it, everything just sort of stopped and I unbuckled myself out of the pack, sort of shook it off, walked myself back up to the trail. And as I was standing there sort of counting my lucky stars and taking a much needed break, all I could hear was this cursing and swearing coming down the trail towards me. And it was Mark <laughs> <laughs> cursing, cursing about the fact that he had to go back and get the canoe and that it didn't seem which, any which way he went on the trail. It was all uphill to him. He says, I just, I just finished going uphill, now I'm going back uphill to get the canoe. So, and I, at that point I thought to myself, it's too bad I didn't have a camera and a microphone right now because this is the stuff that really, really shows what the portage is about. Because everybody at some point, there's moments throughout, I found throughout the trip where you hit these moments of, of joy <laughs> and exuberation and these moments where you just kind of lose your stuff and everybody kind of hits that moment where you just you either laugh or you cry and to see Mark that animated I remember thinking damn that this would have been a really good TV right here because he, he he's just had it he's just fed up and, and we'd all would feel that at some point but it was it was quite yeah, uh, yeah. quite a moment and and I said to him I go well I had a little bit of an episode myself and he goes oh did your pack get away on you I said yeah I got away with got, got away <laughs> with me in it <laughs> at the bottom of the hill oh well I guess you did okay I said I guess I did but uh, definitely definitely something I had never experienced before carrying that that amount of weight on my back yeah yeah, that uh, the 3500 into Radiant was, we, we got rid of a pack. What's the, what's the plan, Matt? What's going on? <laughs> well, we Pain. Got, <laughs> pain. We got five packs, four people, two canoes, <laughs> and one really long portage. So we're going to take try to take this purple pack, which is the most painful pack, uh, and split it up between a bunch of other packs, including the barrel. So yeah, yeah, we'll see what happens, but hopefully we can fit everything in. If not, gonna be pain. A, gonna be a long more pain. Long, more <laughs> pain. More pain. More, more pain. More pain. Ah! So we managed to get everything into three packs. <laughs> Looks like Steve got the brunt of it. Oh, <laughs> well, we'll it's, see. it's taller you. than you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, Good us to you, Steve. Have Here fun. we go. See you on the other side. Uh, there's another side. <laughs> it never ends. Uh, handles. All right, buddy. Can you manage? We'll see. I'm smiling now. We'll see you in a see you in about uh, fifty minutes when we're out the other side. Yeah, that was an interesting one. And then you falling 
If only I had a camera on you to capture I know. that. That would have been funny. Right, we'll, know, we'll, know, we'll, know, we'll know that for next time for yeah, sure. Yeah, GoPros. We'll just, yeah, GoPros. We'll just, GoPros 24-7 recording. I will say that there's nothing like the sense of accomplishment when you get to the end of those trails and you're, the job's done, you've made it to the other side, and you feel that sort of elation of, you know, that's over with, but you can always look back and think about what it was like, the experience, and that you did it. Yeah, I find that you never really remember the pain of the portage. You only feel it in the moment, and then at the end you're like, okay. Like, you say to yourself it wasn't too bad, but you're, I'll never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with that amount of weight. <laughs> Don't do it, Steve. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. <laughs> That's great. Who said this was a good idea? Probably me. <laughs> I uh, would go back and get that, that purple bag from time to time, or just would be coming through with my load. And the, the thing is, is that, you know, Matt is always shooting Mark and Ian. So I would get to the end of the portage <laughs> and it'd be like, oh, and Mark, would be like, <laughs> sorry, Matt would be like, get in the canoe, we gotta go, we gotta go. And I'd be like, what? <laughs> yeah, they're already going, we gotta get going. <laughs> so there was, there was never, never any, never, I thought, where's the kumbaya moment? Where's the, where's the, where's the high five? No, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. <laughs> so that, that was a part for me that, um, that was certainly a, a bit of a jar, for, a bit of a jarring sort of situation where I, I expected there'd be the oh let's have let's have some water and maybe a snack and it'd be like <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's it's, go it's kind of like let's season go. one where uh, where Todd was solo and we were tandem and uh, like he would he would catch up to us and he'd be like hey guys and then we'd be like hey. And then we would just leave. <laughs> and poor Todd's like, I need a break. <laughs> like, I've just been going full out to catch up to you guys, and now i got to keep going kind of thing. Now, getting back to the uh, the gear, I think, um, is there one piece of kit that you wouldn't go without? One Something that's more important than... Well, obviously, like, the the camera is the most important part, and the lenses I bring with me. It's it's the only way I can get the beauty shots. I couldn't do it all with the, with the kit lens that comes with it, but... It's not really good at, at night, and I think uh, shooting at, like, cooking at night's kind of a cool look to it, and uh, talking by the fire. We used a, a quite a fast lens for that, um, so you could see the guys, and I, I tried to put the light as low as possible so I didn't nuke their eyeballs in and, and the complete darkness kind of thing. Um, but uh, couldn't go without. I, might be Mark's microphone because he could be anywhere within a certain distance obviously of me and I could capture something that would be the golden line of the whole show kind of thing so it's uh it's kind of nice to hear him all the time too like I can I can see what he's thinking about before like right before the portage like right before we get to the landing I can hear what he's talking about and uh, hmm. so I can I can preempt them on on things again because Mark loves to talk, and if you just mention one little thing, he'll he'll tell you all about it kind of thing, which is really hard to find in somebody. Uh, to some people say a couple sentences and that's it, or Mark will go in depth and and past experiences and and all that kind of thing. So it's it's really good to to have that microphone on him at all times. Steve, you probably attest to uh, the fact that, you know, a lot of people think, oh, TV, it's all about the picture, but audio is almost just as important. Well, um, especially in Algonquin, uh, there's so many things that we, I mean, visually, Algonquin is, is, is quite appealing, and, um, and, and, you know, the picture is worth a thousand words, but there's certainly much to be said and to be heard uh, of what goes on in Algonquin as well from a sound standpoint. Uh, the one thing that uh, was a new experience for me, uh, because of my responsibility in regards to that, was uh, Matt's alarm would go off pretty much every morning, sometime in the dark, 
at uh, 5.45, 5.30, 6 a.m. Oh, it's, it snuck till 6.30 tomorrow, Steve. And that alarm would go off. Matt would get up and, and there'd be headlamps flapping around in the tent and, and he would be gone. And I would start packing up the tent and I would think, oh, got to get down there and grab that uh, disconnect moment and, and this type of thing. And I was absolutely um, enlightened by the sounds of, and, and the sights, but the sounds of that time in the morning. Setting up the audio for a disconnect moment. Steve, the audio technician. Uh, even when I did my own tripping, I never, I never got up that early. If it, if I did, it was by accident or just to maybe go to the washroom or something. And I would, oh well, look at the sunrise. But there were things that I, 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 I saw and heard, uh, particularly on that, on that series that I had never experienced in my life. And uh, I felt very fortunate to um, be able to capture some of the things and. There's nothing better than when you're rolling with the, you get the microphone sitting on a rock pointing over the flat water and uh, and and birds you know go by and you hear the flapping of their wings and things like that and 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 Matt would just kind of look over his shoulder at me you know from from the camera we just both give each other the nod you know and and uh, but uh, there were certainly moments of that that when you from an audio standpoint, you're listening differently than you normally would uh, just in a natural tripping environment. So it was a unique experience for me from that standpoint. Speaking of disconnects, Ian, I think it's appropriate. This place has got some pretty good bird noises. Let's have a disconnect. I agree. All right, everybody, disconnect moment. Quiet for two minutes. Quiet. There was always there was always something going on, and there was always something there was always something going on. It just never stopped. My my instinct, just as a tripper, when 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 we got to anywhere that we were going, um, I would just start filling water bottles. I would just start getting the purifier and start filling water bottles. I would just start setting up the tent. I would just start gathering firewood. I would just you know get mad a battery at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. in the morning I would just make them a hot chocolate I would I would just that do things nice. instinctively in, 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 in my sort of um, in my broadcasting career being a lot of live television I'm always just looking for the little thing that needs to be done or the little thing that's the loose end or, or the little thing that needs attention so that's where my mind was was a lot of the time uh, and not necessary from a technical standpoint just from what needs to be done and um, uh, sometimes I felt like maybe I wasn't uh, contributing enough technically, but um, things still need to be done. And um, wh whenever I get young young people coming into the industry, and they're kind of, you know, they don't really know exactly what's going on. I said, you know, just come prepared and, and be be helpful, you know, and uh, and people that'll go a long way. And so that was sort of my mindset. Yeah, that was probably one of the. The best things about about you helping out was you you just filled up all those little things that take so much time that people don't I don't think people recognize that on trips they they do them but when you're doing TV like you got it I'm out there for half an hour to an hour shooting sunrise shots not because it takes me that long to shoot it that's just how long the sunrise takes and in all that time the tent's got to be packed up uh hot chocolate if any like breakfast needs to be made all that kind of stuff that you just you do normally when you're out camping but now you got a camera in your hands and that's an hour you're not going to get back kind of thing so to have you to, to do that kind of behind the scenes 
behind the behind the scenes kind of thing to almost take care of me in a way it was it was really helpful and it helped move things along we could move a, we could leave camp a lot earlier in in the day than we did uh on season one which was interesting yeah. at times where we were very behind leaving leaving camp at uh i don't know 12 o'clock <laughs> <laughs> as much as you want to be on the trip you're you're also working yeah exactly it's it's we're we all love camping we all love being out in the wild but for 10 days we're or actually 12 days we're we're working yeah um we had a lot of uh really lightweight gear that we brought along with us as far as uh actually you know things that you need to actual actually go camping uh lightweight tents we had uh lightweight chairs to sit on we had um little roll-up mats to sleep on. You want to talk about those sorts of things? Um, yeah, we tried to make, bring as, like, as least amount of weight as we could because of the TV gear. There's only so much you can cut back on TV gear before you take one thing out and it, it will impact the show. The show will be completely different. So bringing a light tent, um, we brought uh, two three-person tents and I think they totaled Four pounds or no sorry no eight pounds eight pounds total for the two tents and even though one was a little bit leaky uh, <laughs> which we won't mention again um, it still helped us it helps uh, size too like when you're packing stuff most lightweight stuff packs down pretty small so we brought as least amount as we could for ourselves and then that allowed the TV stuff to fit in there as as well like we didn't want to bring six packs that would have been I, I wouldn't have liked that <laughs> <laughs> one thing I uh, uh, you know with our experience in, in tripping we all have our own gear and things that we've we that are tried tested and true and um, and it's funny how when you when you intentionally or not stray from that formula uh, with the example being the tent um, how it how everything sort of escalates from there and uh, the, the, the one sort of situation that comes to mind is the fact that, you know, we, 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 we borrowed a piece of gear that wasn't ours, so it wasn't tried, it wasn't tested. Turned out it wasn't so true either. Um, but in, in regards to that, um, you know, we had, to, we had to rectify that problem by using the one really good tarp so instead of like well, okay well, let's everybody bring a tarp no we should bring one good tarp so that way we have one good tarp that we can you know eat underneath and continue to shoot television well we ended up using that tarp to sacrifice the tarp for the tent and then now we've taken that tarp away from the rest of the the rest of the trip so when we ran into the challenging uh, weather scenarios of rain and, and inclement weather now we're in a situation where we can't just string up the tarp like we had and continue to shoot a TV program and cook underneath the tarp and socialize, which are all very important aspects of any trip, whether you're shooting a TV show or not. Now we're, we're forced to, to, I remember part of the tarp that was over top of our tent, stopping it for the rain from coming in, had like a, an 18-inch vestibule edge that kind of hung over a little bit and that's where we ended up shooting talking by the talking fire, by the fire yeah, because it was the only dry spot in camp that we could sit and seat two people not in the rain and, and sh continue to shoot the tv the tv show all right welcome to talking by the fire from afar under the tarp friday 13th edition <laughs> and i know ian and i uh while you're in the tent having a nap, we were uh, sitting underneath there as much as possible too. Like it was, it was good that we offset it a little bit because uh, Ian had a had a uh, injury, I guess, on on your thumb, and he wanted to put uh, a band aid on it. But you can't do that in the rain, kind of thing. It's getting a little interesting. I'm trying to keep the equipment dry. But, you know, there's not many dry places anymore. It's, we're trying to keep dry ourselves, so. Should be interesting. Ian is uh, injured, so he's gonna fix himself. 
Tis, a, tis but a scratch. Come back here, I'll bite your head off. I think if we're talking by the fire, we were both standing out in the rain and we both just uh, slid the gear underneath the tarp and, yeah. and shot underneath the tarp with the gear, but we were both just standing out there and it, it was coming down. There was a flash of lightning at one point and just like, man. <laughs> but, but that's like, the, those are good memories. Like just when things go bad like that. and You, you make it work. That's yeah, one yeah. thing about working in live television is that there, there's no there's no second take or anything like that in live television it is what it is so you you learn to adapt and you learn to make it work uh regardless of what the situation is you know the the camera's still rolling and and the people are still watching so that's the mindset that that i've you know come to in, uh, embrace the last 20 25 years so in situations like that you just adapt but i remember that one that one rainy site that i think we were on Hogan or? No, it was Lemire. Lemure. And, uh, and I was gassed. And I was lying in the tent, trying to get, like, napping. And, and, all, I, and the, all I could hear was the tent unzipping. And I hear it unzip. And Matt would come in the tent. And I would raise my head up. i go, are you okay? And he'd go, yeah. And he'd be wiping the lens down. And then he'd zoop back out, out again. I hear the tent zip up again. And then I'd fall back asleep for like eight minutes. And then I hear it zip. And I wake up again. I go, you okay? Go, yeah, yeah. I just had to grab some. <laughs> but finally, after that day, everybody kind of went off and at some point had their nap. I think with the exception of you. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't nap because I had to get stuff done. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which, I mean, nonstop, this guy. Um, I, I couldn't believe, I, I remember saying to my, my partner when I got home that from the moment that alarm went off in the morning, I would just, the alarm would go off and I just remember waking up and going, well, it's go time. And Matt would already be halfway out the tent with the camera and a headlamp and gone gone for the moment. But that time on Lemire when it was raining, I finally got my second wind and I got up and I knew we didn't have a tarp and I went over to the fire and there were, wasn't much of a fire. No, there wasn't. And I said to Matt, <laughs> You know, there was quite a wind blowing off the lake, and I said, "You want to give me a hand, and we'll stack these these canoes up, and we'll see if we can't get the wind the wind sort of blocked and, and get this fire going again." And we got the fire going again, and then slowly everybody came out from their tents, and yeah. and we got it going again. But you know, there there's the the challenge once again of, you know, you're relying on specific pieces of gear, and when when one piece goes, then it kind of it kind of escalates out snowballs. Or snowballs from there yeah. and uh, creates secondary and, and third challenges for that so. and the, that morning we had um we had a lot of not not that morning so the next morning we had a lot of issues with a lot of gear because not that it was sitting out in the rain or anything it was just like 100 percent humidity all day kind of thing and we had a lot of moisture behind the main cameras uh between the sensor and the and the front glass that protects the sensor there's moisture in there and that kind of thing like new problems that we never anticipated because we never had rain on the show what's going on matt it's broken not happy not broken but just uh, a little foggy a little misty yeah that's what happens when gear gets put in the rain even with uh even with the rain cover it still gets wet underneath somehow Well, that's getting better. One thing that we brought on our trip, silica packs. We got our sensor problem here, so we're gonna try and put don't, a little silica pack in there. There's lots of room. Don't do this at home. Don't do it at home. So I think we fixed the problem. Yeah, here we go. Bum ba da dun 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 dun. Looks pretty clear to me. Nice and shiny. That is good. No dirt. I'm gonna take these out. Look at this. One, two, three. Check the back element. Surprisingly clean. 
Put this back on here. Click, click, click. Cool. Get out of my way. I gotta go shoot stuff for the viewers. Oh, Jeez. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Forgot my hot chocolate. <laughs> we just work through it. It's like any other camping problem. You just you just work through it and you just find a solution, you work you move forward from there. Speaking of adapting, uh, there's one funny sequence that I think Matt put together a little video of of uh, Big George and the canoe tent. Oh yes. So you know this is I believe now day nine and uh, you know, fatigue factor was 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 moderate to high, but I mean, you kind of get used to it after a while. And one thing that that was a, a little pet peeve of mine uh, throughout as the show progressed was that every time we got to a campsite, Mark would do his little five cent tour, and he would walk around the campsite and go, "Well, this looks like a great spot for a tent right here." And oh, I would I wouldn't camp here. That's that's going to be all rain there and water. And I wouldn't camp here because of this. And oh, there's a tree. Well, those spots that he didn't want to camp, those were the spots that Matt and I would always end yep. up camping. <laughs> they would get all set up, and I'd say to Matt, "Well, where are we going to camp?" He go. <laughs> Well, I guess we have to camp under that limb or we have to go <laughs> camp over there where that soft water spot is or on this hill or whatever. So we got to Big George, which was a, on, on a black route, which was unmaintained and low, low, uh, low maintenance. And uh, we get to Big George and, and uh, uh, Mark says, well, you know, there's enough spot here for a tent here. And, and uh, so that's fine. But there was literally no other options. And the one option that we did come up with we kind of laid out the footprint of the tent by just laying it into place without pegging it down. And as I climbed in the tent, I and lie, flipped over on my back, I literally slid down into like a ditch that was like about a foot deep <laughs> <laughs> off to the side. And I just broke into laughter and Matt goes, what, what are you laughing at? And he peeks his head in the tent and I'm lying there with like my feet up in the air again. And uh, I said, I don't know. I don't know where two people are supposed to sleep in this tent. One person can sleep dead in the center or you're going over either way. Normally I get my level out and I kind of check <laughs> the four corners of the tent yeah. and then the center. Yeah, you had like a screed rail going on the last one with your foot, just leveling it all out. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Hey, we got any extra socks in the net using? <laughs> Some pool noodles, maybe? <laughs> maybe you could just bunch up your sleeping mattress into that corner. And then the way you won't roll into it. Just put a canoe underneath. Does <laughs> Steve uh, sleeping in the canoe and the what? <laughs> yeah, at least the canoe's flat. Put my yeah. thermo rest in there. Actually, it would, that would be a bad that idea. That might not be a bad idea. Put Matt right in the center here. Yep. This is rock solid for one guy. <laughs> like, I just lied there and it's like rock, it's perfect. Speaking of post, I've never done this before, although I've, I've heard about it. Um, I'm thinking about just because of the overall attraction of the flatness of the bottom of the canoe. I'm considering putting my sleeping pad and sleeping bag uh, in the bottom of the canoe. And if you're coming your way, I'm gonna center right where your feet are. Yeah. Jeez, that might be it. Holy <laughs> frig. Pardon the erection. <laughs> wow, look at how flat that is. <laughs> I've never seen anybody so hard, so hard on a on a flat <laughs> surface. <laughs> my level over there? Can we get my level? Uh, pretty excited. What more can I say? I would need like a uh, some pretty hard liquor to accommodate myself into that spot over there. <laughs> And have the empty bottle lying on my chest, maybe with a little bit of vomit on the other side. <laughs> so we got a line here going all the way up to these two paddles. Everything's E-taped together. And uh, we're going to put the tarp over top of that. Try to give him some shelter against the dew tonight when it drops.
There we go. And I might have to pin down. Uh, so this corner and maybe that corner over there because that's where the wind keeps spreading. It's gonna be tough. Try to get in there. Only got to do it once, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but I pee every he's day. He's in. He's in. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going in there, Steve? Don't smash your head on the. <laughs> <laughs> How's that, bud? <laughs> Is it flat? That's it's probably really the, flat. That's probably the flattest you've had this whole oh. trip. Oh. <laughs> Who needs He's a, in heaven. Who needs a tent? He's in heaven. Who needs a tent? Just bring your canoe. Bring a tarp. That's right. Some paddles. You, you need a lot. Took of a while to set up, but hey, it's good to go. I like it. <laughs> What's going on in there, Steve? <laughs> If the boats are rocking, don't come a knocking. I think it's gonna be all right. <laughs> Get out of here, you. <laughs> You're creepy. So, Steve, how was the canoe? The canoe was canoe uh, different. It was a little claustrophobic at first, being stuck under th three thwarts, but um, it was flat. It was it was rather secure, which was. You know, nothing coming at you from the sides and had the fly above me, so it got pretty dewy uh, in the morning. But uh, I figured out how to lie on my side, uh, which was really good after the big portage yesterday and letting the body relax a little bit. So it was good. I would definitely do it again. <laughs> I got a way better night's sleep than I, I certainly would have inside the tent. And I remember waking up in the, in the morning and sort of climbing out of my, my setup and pulled the tarp back and the first person I saw sitting there was Mark and he went, good morning. <laughs> uh, yeah. the, the camera's always rolling. Yeah, the camera's always rolling. And I'm always intrusive. I'm, I feel bad for these guys because like, I, I'm, I'm the guy who, like the time that Mark poked his eye out and Steve had, had the, the diary camera with him, and I had to be the guy to ask, like, where are you rolling on that? Like, because we're shooting a TV show and it just, I hate to ask that when something bad happens, but gotta ask it. Ah! Ooh. What do I do? Oh, I'm wearing contact lenses too, eh? Oh really? That's what, probably what's going on. So we, we gave it a shot with the water bottle and uh... Hey, wash your brain out. Yeah. Thank you, sir. No, I what? thought of that. What did you say? Did you have to get on camera? Get on camera? No. <laughs> well, it's true. No one films adversity, right? It's yeah. like, you hear from me getting chased by that bear. I'm just, I'm always in people's personal space, I feel like, and no one really likes me because of that. <laughs> <laughs> and also because I asked them to say it again and again and again. Hey, Mark, can you say that again? <laughs> can you do that again? Oh. Yeah, so, uh, should I start talking now? Yeah, what? you can go. Oh, hello. Ah. Imagine you want cheese again. You want some cheese? Do it again. Okay. Ready? Say cheese. Cheese. Uh -huh. Thank you, sir. Hey, Mark. Yeah, you this is oh, nice. Say it again. Finally some sun, eh, Mark? Oh, man-made. Say that again. See something over there that looks man-made. This is what it is again, Mark? What's that? This is what it is again? Yeah, this is a trail. Uh, I think it's a winter portage. Say it again. Honey, we're home. Can I say that again? Yep. Okay. 
was eating some oatmeal here behind the tree because it's really windy. Oh. Where's your log? Mark, you say you're ready again? Are you ready? Right. Say it again. All right. Say that again. Say it again. I said, I wish this portage was like this for 685 meters, all boardwalk. That a old fire pit. Say huh. it again. Huh. Look at that, an old fire pit. Just catch us some bulls right back in there. Let's see the first part again. Can you say it all again, sir? Damn it. Sorry. Matt. Sorry. I'm not a I'm not a magician. I don't know what that means. I'm not a robot, Matt. Well it's all part of telling a story, right? And you gotta get all those parts in. Exactly, yeah. Um tell us about um, is there, you know, the other challenges that you came up against when, uh, when you're trying to tell the story of this adventure? Um, you've, you've probably got to have a pretty good running narrative going on in your head to say, oh, you know, like, th I need, we need this part, we need to do this, or we need to, you've got that, you have to have that image in your head of what the show is encompassing. Yeah, I mean, before we even left, it, months before we even left, I had a 30, 35 page book of what we're doing every day, what distance we were going, where the sun rose, what degree the sun rose, what time it did, when it set, when the moon came up, uh, all the points of interest on the lakes that we were going to, um, just kind of everything that if you were gassed, you could pull that out, you could look at it, and you could be like, Okay, let's shoot this now because it's already been planned. It, it makes sense to the story and the, like the story of this of this uh, series was was the history of the park was to to show uh, all these artifacts and and your uh, interest in it and uh, to have it all on paper and even have the artifacts pictures of, of 70, 80, 90, 100 years ago was really important before we even got there to see it and then be like, okay, this is what we're expecting to see. We know what changed, everything like that. So to have that booklet to tell us uh, the important things of the day was was valuable, I would say. It took a lot of work to make it, but it was, it, it made up for its its time and when, uh, when we needed it most. That probably comes from you know, as a person who goes tripping, you and you're you're out there in the wilderness. You're on your own. You have to have a plan going in. You can't just go and say, "Oh, well, we're just going to take this route." And if, if you don't know what you're getting yourself into, then you become you could become grossly unprepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Steve would know this. Even just just planning a canoe trip is sometimes hard enough. Of like. Of five plus days where are you gonna be what's the weather what should I bring all that kind of stuff and then on top of that what's the story that we're shooting um, what gear do I need to bring all that kind of stuff so like having having Steve there too like he's done it for many many years almost longer than I've been alive probably that's sorry Steve that's all right. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> And to have uh, him and Mark kind of like behind you saying like, let's do this. Like, here's here's young me like, woo, let's let's do this thing. <laughs> woo, yeah, yeah. let's go do more. Uh, the whole way down the last portage, you, I could hear you saying, I did this to myself, I did this to myself. <laughs> it's true, I did do it to myself and to you guys. I feel like I'm gonna be sleeping outside tonight. You're cool. The dog house. You can put, put a disclaimer at the end of this saying, no human beings were hurt or mistreated <laughs> during the filming of, of this episode or? He's not human. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, no Matt, like let's let's take a breather, let's think this out because this is an important time. Like, just because I don't know that it's an important time kind of thing. So it's it's good to have people who are experienced to who've d been there done that in bad and good situations and who can uh, help along with the planning process too because uh, 
we weren't planning to do that 32 kilometers in a day, but I think because we prepared ourselves so much, we were able to. Well, when we ran into the adversity of the weather um, and we ended up uh, staying staying on Lemure mm -hmm. and um, and um, not Lemure. Um, yeah, we stayed on Lemure and uh, Hogan as well it, because it, it was we, we were gonna we were gonna venture out and we decided against it. There was there was lots of white capping on the on the water, mm -hmm. and um, from from my own ex my own experience, I was I was like, well, let's go for it. But then there's that that sort of that moment of reason where you go, okay, look at you know what, it's it's September, the water's still warm, we're we're all we're all wearing life jackets, you know, we we got all our gear with us here, everything's gonna float. Oh wait a minute, we're shooting a TV show, and if we capsize, there's no more TV show. We might make it to shore and everything will be fine from that standpoint, from a tripping standpoint. But the moment we capsize. There's no TV show and there's no gear because a lot of that stuff was not going to float. And I remember Matt <laughs> took that purple bag and he, he, he fastened it onto the canoe at one point. He said, if something happens, he goes, that thing's going right to the bottom of the lake. And I go, <laughs> I thought to myself, yeah, and we're all going to the bottom of the lake with it because that thing's not going to float at all. But there was that little tweak where we're used to, you know, like I remember Mark explained to Ian when we were, we were kind of crossed some rough waters the one day and he said hey don't worry you're wearing a life jacket if we go in you're going to be fine you're going to float we'll, we'll we'll address the situation from there and i thought that's 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 great advice and then later on when the the adversity even increased and we were still kind of thinking yeah maybe then that was the point where it was like no if we capsize capsize now then it's pretty well game over for the show i mean maybe not for us but definitely for the show so you have to always remember that you are shooting a TV show and that, that that's the priority of why you're there. Yeah, like, I, I try not to bring Pelican cases. I know a lot of people bring Pelican cases and keep their more expensive cameras in the Pelican case, but we're shooting a half-hour TV show every day. So it's a lot of content. So the camera is literally between my legs. And I remember multiple times, every single day, I would th I would plan flipping over. What would happen right now if I flipped over? And every single time it would be, how do I grab the camera, get into the water, and keep that camera above my head so it doesn't get wet? <laughs> that's, that, because that's how important the TV show was. Like that camera touches the water, like it's it's over, it's done. You can't shoot a TV show on a GoPro or a, or a tiny little uh, like diary camera, this little, little point and shoot camera kind of thing. It's, so, to, to stop, to some people it may have seemed unnecessary, but for us it was, if you want to keep seeing this TV show, you, <laughs> we're stopping kind of thing. And there was times where it was like, we, we were gone with that tailwind on Hogan. Yeah. And I remember, like, you, when you're on a wave coming, like, riding a wave and it starts to twist on you, you can just feel that twisting and you know, like, if Steve's not paying attention and he doesn't get that right, we're just gonna roll over. It's just like, okay, let's just stop and and take our time and yeah. kind of thing. It's not worth the risk. Yeah, it's pretty trippy when your when your tailwind and your tail waves are coming from two different directions. Yeah, and they kind of meet at one one spot there. Yeah, and, and, uh, and everything. There were other issues that came up. Uh, a microphone. Uh, my mine in particular did, wasn't kind of crapped out the first day. But I hope they, yeah, I hope they appreciate the, uh, the hard work that goes into. You have to carry all the equipment. You have to uh, adjust for the weather. And I don't know if you want me to run them off, or do you want to run them off? Uh, yeah, we we had a lot of audio issues this time around. We waterproofed the mics, but. Microphones don't like water, <laughs> and I know Steve can attest to this because we do CFL games, and if it rains, it pours usually, and those mics gotta keep working. So he's really good at waterproofing stuff, but electronics and water just don't mix. And no. uh, that first that first day, I, actually, we had that gorgeous sunrise, and then boom, it started boom. to rain, and everything's all of a sudden wet, and we weren't really expecting that. No. And that just takes a toll on the gear. Like, we, we lost your microphone. Uh, that records internally, though, so 
we didn't know that we lost it. It was still recording, but the mic didn't work, the actual microphone. What else did we lose? Uh, we lost your, your pack. Your pack broke. Oh, the uh, the purple pack. Yeah. Gee, go figure. Yeah. yeah. There's a little plastic piece that <laughs> yeah, uh, linked both straps on. I've had that pack since I've had that pack since 1992. Jeez. Once again, dating myself. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, it finally gave it finally gave way with the with the load of uh, batteries and gear that it had in there. Yeah. I think if we could put a piece of wire or a, a zip tie, a couple of zip ties through there. This, if you, we anchor into this. Through here, we're, we're okay. We're just bypassing the plastic. Pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty another Broke anchor something. Point. Another anchor. Broke a strap. That would make the climb a little tougher. And the rest of the 10 day trip. And the rest of the 10 day trip. Did you fix it? Yeah. We just put, a, put some uh, rope through there and tie it up. Hopefully, it lasts the rest of the trip. It was right in the, right in the joint of the, where the two straps meet the body of the pack and uh, yep. definitely a concern at the time. Yeah, yeah, you're just looking at it and it's the purple pack, it's the heaviest pack and you're like, oh shoot, like do we have to, do we have to carry it like this for the rest <laughs> of the trip? Like what are we gonna have to do with this thing now? And then luckily we were able to work our way out of it. How did you deal with uh, backing up the media and all the storage, you know, you're shooting all that footage? Well, I think for the first time in history that uh, Bench on Burnt Root Lake saw its first computer. <laughs> we did bring a small little cheap computer uh, just for the full, for the sole purpose of backing up media. So uh, I had a couple hard drives. I think I had five terabytes worth of hard drives and uh, a card reader and popped it in, copy paste, done. What you doing? Uh, you know, backing up garbage. media. There's tree stumps all over the place, right? There's no tree stumps. <laughs> we got cards. We got hard drives. We record a lot of footage on this show. So. Here's another hard drive. That's all we do. That's all AO does. Here's another hard drive. <laughs> so many hard drives. <laughs> and you've got a hard drive on your computer. Yeah. Don't look, so it's my password. Oh, look, look, look away, look away. Look, Google, Google works. Suddenly this year I'm doing a lot of trips. Oh, I got Wi Fi out here. Like, okay. Google, which is so, kilometers up the biggest thing in a park. I have memory cards here. And, and I have a uh, hard drive here. And like card uh, reader here, computer in between. So I put up one window on one side of the hard drive, one window on the other side of the uh, card reader, and I just dump it to the hard drive, copy paste. Takes about an hour for a Thompson in the Mac for 128 gig card. Do you create two versions of the file forever? Yeah, I'll be putting it on two two different hard drives. Yeah, yeah. I like coming to Burnt Root this way and from the north. for as long as I can, I keep the cards. So yeah. if, even if both hard drives fail, I still have a third There's card a backup. Yeah. It all worked out in the end. Got home and checked everything. Oh, I was so stressed when I got home. I, I think that was the first thing I did when I got <laughs> home. Is I plugged in the hard drive and all the cards and going through all the date time stamps on the on the files and like. Oh, it's all there. <laughs> okay, we got a show. Okay, let's <laughs> let's do this. Steve, would you do it again? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, I would do it again. I, uh, uh, it, it was definitely a trip of a lifetime for me. Uh, it, it challenged me in ways that I had never been challenged before. It it made me realize that I, um, that I was stronger mentally and physically than than I thought. Um, I remember doing a trip 20, maybe 20, 25 years ago, and uh, the guy that was sort of mentoring me said, pacing is everything. You can, you can go, you can paddle a long way and you can travel a long way just, just by pacing and keeping your pace. And that very first portage on the very first day, <laughs> I probably, probably the first, in the first 10 steps that I made, I thought to myself, you can do this trip if you just pace yourself, but if you go faster than you have to, there's no way you're gonna make it even past day one. And with that mindset, that basically got us through, got me through that entire trip.
I think there were several times on the trip where we both said to each other, everybody needs a Steve. Yeah, everyone <laughs> needs a Steve. The other thing you should bring in your camping trip is a Steve. You should always have a Steve around your campsite. Hard working. Gather wood, get Always warm. smiling. <laughs> Quick with a joke. He cuts wood. He, you would get to camp and we would be shooting something and you turn around and there would be a heap a pile of wood there and you're like, how the heck did you get that? And there are points where it's like, where's Steve? Like, we're looking in the tents. He must be out getting wood. Day 43, life is uh, slowly easing into a rhythm. Just wondering how you were doing on the power. Matt continually shooting, Mark constantly cooking and Steve is just off in the bush collecting firewood. We haven't seen him in five days. He would come back with this giant pile in his arms <laughs> and it's like, geez Steve, you, you getting all this wood for the next like 10 campers? Like, I know on, uh, on Burnt Root we had a we had a big pile yeah, going there. Yeah, we did. And that was all Steve. Like, uh, I don't know. I, I maybe chopped one log <laughs> the whole trip. And <laughs> well, that was always a, that was a two-way street with everybody. I remember the the the, the very rainy uh, day that we had um, on Lemire, mm -hmm. and uh, in the morning it was all about drying stuff out, moving it around, and getting it to another spot that would dry. It, certain areas were drying faster than others. And uh, Ian and Matt were over uh, by the fire, uh, making up for a couple cooking segments that uh, that had to get done, and, and and mostly we had to get them done because the the, the fruit was spoiling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we had to get we had to get rid of those damn oranges that we'd been carrying since day one, and the apples. And uh, I'm moving stuff around, moving stuff around, and I can hear the you know as usual I can hear stuff going on in the background. I'm always trying to be conscious and dodge behind a tree and whatnot. And all of a sudden Ian comes up behind me and goes. Here, you gotta try this. And he hands me the orange with the spoon sticking in it with the brownie in there. And I go, really? And he goes, oh no, you gotta try it. <laughs> I remember taking a big spoonful of this steaming hot brownie out of this orange and taking a bite and I went, oh my gosh, that's good. <laughs> you can keep that one. I go, really? Yeah, you can keep that. And I just got eating it and eating it. And then like 20 minutes later, he comes back and he goes, you gotta try one of these apples with the granola bar stuck in it. And I go, yeah. And he goes, oh no, you gotta. And I just thought to myself, if you were with a family, if you were with a family of kids, that apple with the granola bar stuffed in would be such a morale booster for, for a, if you had like family and yep. kids and stuff and you got to camp and you just went around and handed those out to everybody, that would be a real a and real treat. Even making them's fun too. I was cursing those 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 fruit things. Yeah. <laughs> Until that moment I went, wow, this is really good. I think the most memorable meal for me, and I can't even remember what we ate with it, um, was the salvaging the green beans. So what I'm going to do <laughs> is I'm going to go get the spatula or whatever, the tongs, and I'm going to uh, sprinkle some of this garlic pepper on here and some oil, and then we're going to put it on the fire. Oh yeah. Tuna masala is good. Mm-hmm. It's all good. Mm. The beans are my favorite though. Oh yeah, the beans are freaking awesome. Because mm. some of them had gone a little off and so I picked them out and I, because we were just going to throw them all in the fire, but I was like, no, well, let's, let me see what I can get out of it. Yeah, I think but, those were like at the bottom of the barrel or something and, <laughs> and you pulled them out and you're like, no way. And that was all you. You were like, you found the, the garlic powder, the salt, the pepper, and yep. then you went went to town. You enjoyed that one too, I Steve. Oh, they... That was a nice surprise because I first of all I didn't know what was in that barrel, <laughs> and then all of a sudden on you know day day nine it's like, here man you got to try some of these as usual, but no they were they were very good very good and I remember watching uh, that episode with my partner Beth and I and I said to her these things were so good Ian Ian whipped these things up somehow some way <laughs> they were really good yeah sometimes yeah. it's just simple salt pepper a little little season yeah that's all you need. Um, Matt, the show's been uh, second season wrapped up. People are watching, people are commenting. What uh, what's that been like? Um, the comments have been all positive coming in. Uh, people 
people love the show no matter what happens in it and uh, I think people just like seeing adversity and conquering things and learning stuff at the same time so uh, I don't know it's it's been it's been doing a lot better than season one and I think that's just because people know about it and the whole uh, COVID thing they're stuck at home so they want to they want to get their their intake of camping why they because they can't and uh yeah it's it's just been a it's been nothing but positive feedback from everybody and lots of questions too that's that's why we're making this too because people have a lot of questions about what else happened because they they know that there's other people there and that they're they're also making a a tv show but they're also camping so they're just wondering like what's how do they survive how do they (laughs) how are they doing everything so it's it's all good feedback and it's great to hear from people the same people over and over and over again too like to hear their thoughts and it's it's kind of it's weird because like I never really thought to put this on YouTube and then uh, I did and people enjoy it and when you put something up on cable TV you don't really ever hear anything unless it's bad and there's a problem but uh, on YouTube it's a community and you get to hear back from people in the comment section and that's really valuable just to hear what people like and and dislike but no one seems to to dislike anything so it's it's kind of cool so what's on the horizon for the show is there a season three is there mm-hmm. you know what do you want to hear pe- what people want to want to see next time i would like to hear what people want to see next time yeah it'd be it'd be interesting to to see what people can come come up with and ideas um, a season three, we'll see. Um, it it all depends on uh, uh, logistics. Uh, obviously, the current world situation plays a big part into that. What I like to do is season three, of course, while I'm still young and can still do it, and <laughs> still uh, still have the uh, the muscle power to to push through those hard days, um, and like bringing the uh, the amazing images like. I know people say that, oh, you shoot great images. I'm like, yeah, that's great, but I'm provided great images. Like, that's that's legitimately what I'm seeing, and I just point a camera in that direction, and that's what you see kind of thing. Um, so it's it's worth it to bring those home and share, share it with people, people who can't get out there, people who um, uh, just had kids and they just they, they want to get out there and they have been, they can't, or people who are older who used to go out there and they can't eat anymore it's it's a great relief and of course in the end of the year when you're like starting to get a little a little itchy and you you want to go out but it, there's still ice in the lakes it's a good good time of the year to watch it and to just kind of relieve that stress of going outside but season three we'll see i'm, I'm working on it i'm working on it, i'll say that <laughs> Well, thank you, Matt, for lending us behind the scenes, giving us some insight as to how you pulled the show off. And no thanks, Steve, for coming out again. And uh, uh, I hope there is a season three, and I hope that all the viewers are along with us to, uh, to watch it again. Uh, thanks for watching this. And if you have any questions or comments, please, down below. Thanks, guys. Smash that like button. <laughs> Hit that subscribe button. Boom!